Well, hey there, it's Tommy Tool with how to get more out of your breakup than just heartache. This is module two. And this is protect, protect, protect. This is the module about, as you guessed, protecting yourself and your assets and your environment and your kids and all that. But right now we're gonna start with how to protect you. And in this module, you'll discover the big picture, which is my number one rule. I'll get to that. And um, proactive is attractive. Those are a couple of things that I want to leave you with um, at the end of this um, module. So this is uh, something my sisters used my old my next oldest sister used to say to me. I have three older sisters, and yeah shoot me now, right? Feel bad for me because I have three older sisters that I had to always um, just kind of deal with. But they taught me a lot of good lessons in life as a young girl. And one of them was get a jump on the dump. My sister used to always say to me that if um, I was complaining about a boyfriend, she'd say, oh, well, you know, he's just getting ready to dump you. So you might as well just get a dump, jump on the dump and you'll feel a lot better. And so um, I kind of lived with that for a while and she was right about some things. I, I embraced that expression um, a few times. But um, so uh, that's not necessarily what I'm gonna teach you about <laughs> or um, talk about, but it is something that I want you to kind of, um, just for fun, hang on to that expression. And we'll get to that in a minute. So how to feel in control when you have no control of the situation. I'll give you some strategies about that and um, give you some action items to help you feel in control when, when you don't feel like you have any at all. All right, so let's talk about um, getting a jump on the dump. So, all right, so nobody wants to be the one left stuck holding the bag. The general rules for divorce are like the general rules in life. They're all um, sort of like the unwritten codes of conduct that most of us understand, but we don't always abide these rules of conduct. So, for example, if you are feeling fat, you don't talk about how fat you are around someone who is fatter. Sort of like this. Oops, sort of like that. Um, you know, that sort of thing. We all understand that you don't wear your slippers to the bus stop or around town, for that matter. You you don't walk up to someone's front yard and start picking fruit off their trees. These are all kind of the, the rules, unwritten rules of conduct. You don't pick your nose or pop a zit while you're in traffic, and you don't name your kid Osama, right? Those are just things that we just kind of know without talking about it. As kids, we all played the not it game. Remember that? That was the game that we all played to pick the one who wanted to do, um, who had to do the seeking in the game of hide-and-go-seek. It went sort of like this. Everyone would be bored with the present game. Like, you know, maybe it was Monopoly or Clue or whatever. And in a flash, it was decided that uh, a game of hide-and-go-seek was in order. So without warning, someone shouts, one, two, three. And then like popcorn, everyone in earshot chimes in, not it, not it, not it. And then the last kid... The clueless one, the one who was winning the other game, looks up from the board, and at that moment, everyone shouts, You're it! And runs off to hide, leaving the clueless kid holding the dice. So in theory, you should only lose the not it game once. The trick and the lesson in life is to be clued in and in tune with the rest of the world around you. So oftentimes, we are the last ones to know our world is about to change. We weren't even clued into the one, two, three warning. We missed it or ignored it completely. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that that warning that the, the ex is out too late or they're messing around or they're not carrying their own weight, you know, they're out spending your money, whatever. Those are the one, two, three warnings, the red flags. So when our lives are turned upside down, we are usually unprepared for what is about to happen next. Whether we are the one uh, leaving or the one being left, we all feel like the one who got stuck holding the dice. No matter what end you're on, you always feel like you got you were the one that got stuck holding the dice. During and after a divorce, it's easy to feel like you are the kid who keeps losing the knotted game. The secret to success is in awareness. So to help you get a jump on the rest of your world or a jump on the dump, let me give you some of the rules. 
So protect yourself. Things um, that you might want to be clued in on, okay? And that game of um, not it. Um, get informed about divorce and the process of divorce. Get informed about, you know, what it, what a court um, hearing is like for divorce court. I would sit in on a couple because um, if you get a chance to ever just sit in on one, maybe um, see if you can because it's interesting. It's a cattle call and you're so nervous going in and, you know, going up against the person that you took this vow for life and basically having a lawsuit a, a, to sue this person is almost what it is. And doing that in court and then realizing all of a sudden that this isn't a private matter. This is in front of everyone else who scheduled that day to have their same divorce laundry aired right with you. So you, it's a cattle call. Like I said, you go up and you listen to, you know, the Joneses and the Smiths and the, you know, Bickersons or whoever right before you. And then you realize, oh my gosh, this is, everyone gets to hear and see what we're going through. And suddenly, you know, some of these cases make you look really good because um, you learn what not to do by some of the other people. But I, I just want to tell you, you know, once you sat in on something like this, you realize the judge has heard it all and he has very little tolerance for um, arguing in court. Um, you know, he's, his goal is to just get through all these people as quickly as possibly, as civilly as possibly, and as fairly as possibly. And um, to do it Monday through Thursday, because usually they don't hold court on Friday. Um, so anyway, the way to kind of get clued in on that is, you know, do some reading. But you may not have a chance to, to read or go to the court and sit in on something like this. So talk to friends. Um, scour the internet. You don't have to read books verbatim, you know, word for word. But do do look at table of contents and see what's what's out there, what some of the processes are, what some of the frequently asked questions are about the process, and, you know, just kind of familiarize yourself because with familiarity, um, you can alleviate some stress. So... Um, my next action step, which was, I said, talk to friends, going through divorce, what their experience was like at court. Um, action step three is keep a binder and keep a binder with tabs to help you stay organized and keep your notes and documents um, together. Because um, before going to court, you also want to have like maybe a one page summary of maybe the requests that you're making or some of the issues that you have with dates and facts backed up and just kind of a just a one page or even like a paragraph summary of what you're asking the judge for. Because I'll tell you what, when you go in, you, you do get brain dead. You, it's very intimidating and you really do need a crib sheet um, to be your best friend and hold your hand through that. And if you can be your own best friend and have that um, done ahead of time, like I said, proactive is attractive. The judge will look at you um, like, hey, you know, you've kind of got it on going on maybe – uh, you're, you know, you're pretty the responsible one in this, and you, you, you will look a little bit more favorably. So, uh, you can thank me later for this uh, too, because, like I said, he, he who is most prepared in court wins. Uh, let me go down to this little slide that I have here. Um, so, yeah, he who is most prepared in court wins. Be careful who you confide in. Don't always give away your plan to the wrong person. So, what by what I mean by this is sometimes, you know, we're vulnerable during this stage and we want to share our frustrations and our fears and our sadness with the company that we keep at present. And a lot of that, it's a lot of the time that is your in-laws too and sister-in-laws, brother-in-laws. But you've got to remember that their loyalty is, you know, blood is thicker than water. And eventually, um, some of the things you say may get back to your ex. And so just be careful about re revealing too much of your plan and um, confiding in the wrong people. So, um, you know, even though I had a really good relationship with all of my in-laws, um, it just, you know, their, their loyalty is divided and they're going to side with um, their blood. So just keep that in mind. Um, let's see, what was I going to say here? <laughs> so you want to decide to, 
um, when the best time to inform your spouse or, you know, the soon to be ex of your actions, like you may not want to tell them that you're going to file for the divorce until you actually, um, have them served because, you know, they may not be ready for the divorce, um, and may not want to receive the summons. So sometimes you have to have them served and well, actually all the time you have to have them served and, um, you know, it's better to alleviate the anxiety and don't say, oh, hey, by the way, you know, be here at two o'clock because I'm going to have someone serve you. Um, that's not the way you want to do it. <laughs> um, you know, and unfortunately, you kind of have to be a little this way because that's, um, and by that, I mean, you have to be a little bit um um, secretive, I guess. I guess that's the word. Um, because you don't want to give away everything. You want to make sure that they get the paperwork and that there's no doubt about the fact that you did serve them. Um, because it's a lot of time and expense. If they aren't served correctly, then the whole case can be thrown out and you've got to start over. And then that throws your whole um, strategy off, right? So don't waste time. Do things correctly the first time. Um, more about protecting you. So, you know, a lot of times people are very agitated during this time. And when you have children involved and you have to uh, use restraint um, around the kids and you just, your goal is to just drop off and receive the children. Um, sometimes it's a lot more fraught with anxiety than is necessary but nonetheless, there is a lot of anxiety. So my my thing to you is, unless you are really in fear of your life, okay. So um, if you don't, if you're not fearing your life, you know, maybe you could just have a friend sit with you and hold your hand because it is it can be anx um, like I said, anxiety ridden. Um, you could meet in a public place where there's a lot of people around, and you don't get a chance to. Um, you know, yell or bicker with one another. But if you are fearful of your life and um, you have cause for um, that fear, uh, then document everything, get a restraining order. Um, I believe you'll have to go through mediation at first before you go to court now. And um, you know, document everything because if you're fearful of your life or leaving the children and somebody who has anger issues, then these are legitimate fears and um, you need to document everything so that you don't have to go through this process. And yeah, is it um, worth the battle of, um, you know, not letting your children go with the ex? Um if you're afraid that the ex has been drinking or whatever, or is on some sort of, you know, drug of whatever, yeah, um, don't give in to that. Stand your ground and file a report and document it and have witnesses to the fact of this. So, um, you know, but use your best judgment. Uh, if you are in fear, you do need to seek um, the authorities and get that, um, you know, even have them at your house or whatever if you suspect um, you know, there will be some violence or whatever. You, you just um, ask for help. So again, um, moving down, I want to just say um, when you are um, the one who files for return, files for a divorce, you're the one who's driving the bus. You set the tone, you set the pace, um, and um you make things happen. You're not the one who's responding to the court orders and not necessarily, you're not the one that has the deadline to respond. So the way this works in absence of a response, if the ex does not respond to the court um, papers that you filed, then pretty much you win the case, right? So it's very important that if you're the one served that you respond, otherwise you lose the case. So when you're driving the bus and you're filing the um, divorce papers, you get to set the pace of um, how this is all going to happen. So that's important. Um, so again, to wrap this chapter up, try to get a jump on the dump, file first and do those things. Uh, keep everything moving. Keep a document, uh, a binder with all your facts documented. Um, keep a journal. 
protect you and again um, uh, document everything it'll just give you that a little edge in court all right well thanks for joining me and um, we'll get through this module because these are not pleasantries but um, we will get through some of this stuff and move on to some of the better better topics okay and thanks I'll see you in the next video